Hello everyone, this is my analysis of themes in Full Metal Demon Muramasa. I wanted to make this video because I couldn't find any discussions about the many themes explored in this game. I also think that a lot of people have a misconception about what this game is, thinking it's just about mechas and brown dwarves and shit, so I hope this will clarify these and get new people interested in this game. And in fact it is about mechas and brown dwarves and elves and so much much more. I will mostly talk about the major and minor themes of the game, as well as mentioning the characters who push these themes. This visual novel is such that every character is explored to the point that a different message of the game can be extrapolated depending on which character you look at and interests you the most. Basically, there's a lot to talk about. I'll also talk about anything that I m think might interest you as well. Before we begin, this is not a review. If you're looking for a thorough review of this game, there are a couple of videos out on YouTube already. If you're not interested about the plot or setting, I suggest you go and watch any of those right now and then come back to the video. Almost all of them think that Full Metal Demon Muramasa is worth a read. But we can at least start with some basics. Full Metal Demon Muramasa is a Japanese visual novel developed by Nitro Plus. It was released in 2009 in Japan and is considered by the Japanese otakus as one of the kamikaze or god games, a title given to visual novels of exceptional quality such as Mobile of Alternative, Umineko, Tsubahibi and many others. It was translated in 2021 by Just USA. This translation came as a surprise and it was handled great. This game is insanely difficult to translate in my opinion and credit should be given to the translators for managing to do it well. This is a long visual novel and you should try to reach the uh, true ending of this game for a complete experience. It's written by Narahara Itetsu with art from Namaniko ATK. Muramasa has a fan disc and a side story with a sequel currently in the works called Project Vermilion. Also a spoiler warning for any of you who don't know anything about anything more than the synopsis, so you should stop watching. I'll try to make these spoilers as minor as possible. Who is Narahara Itetsu? He is the scenario writer and the director of this game. I would put his photo here as well, if I had it that is. He is not a very prolific storyteller, however that definitely does not discredit this man's prose. He is a freelance writer and has allegedly never written anything after Muramasa because he cannot think of anything to top it, which is a lie because he is currently working with Nitro Plus on a sequel. His first work is I read is called Hanachirasu, it's translated and available on Just USA site. It's a dark samurai story set in a modern day Japan where different factions fight each other economically and with private armies, while a communist lolly called Kaigen is leading a zombie army to conquer Japan. A big war happened, Japan is like a new feudalist state. Even with advanced technology, the use of guns is forbidden and traditional martial arts and weapon arts are practiced instead. Use of firearms is considered almost a sin. The setting is interesting, but the main story revolves around the two samurai on the cover, the short king in red kimono and the brooding menace to society standing right next to him. If you're interested in Narahara Itetsu, I wholeheartedly recommend this game. His stories are usually set in bleak, futuristic, alternate history settings with strong and willful characters who push the status quo, which coincidentally is one of the reasons some people might compare him to earlier Genu Rabuchi, as well as that both authors really ma love martial arts in their stories. And when I say love, that's an understatement. Narahara Itetsu is a Kenjutsu Shihandai, which is like a step below a Shihan or the grand master of a particular martial art. The way fights and duels are described in both games is absolutely incredible and it definitely pushes the limit on how much you can engage someone just by reading the fights play out. Moving on. Namaniko ATK is a Japanese illustrator working for Nitro Plus. His best known works include games like Sayano Uta, Demon Bane, Phantom of the Inferno, Phenomeno, Outlaw Django, which he also directed. Besides this, he draws light novel illustrations and he illustrated Chaika the Coffin Princess. He is an aggressive heterosexual, a degenerate, and an ass man, which you will realize as soon as you google his handle. Now we will move on to the themes of this game. The major themes explored in Muramasa are the laws, crime and punishment, self-righteousness, and the fight between true good and true evil. 
There are other themes which the game explores, but I'd say they're minor themes, like the nature of power, racing, imperialism, self-gratification, capitalism, industrial whaling, and others. So let's begin with the law. The law in Muramasa is seen as the central concept which we need to understand in this game. It's so deeply interconnected with every character in this show, it's not only one of the motivations for them doing anything, but also a plot device and the central cause of inner and outer conflict. Also, when I say law, I don't relate it in any way to legal law or anything of that sort, like judges, courts, whatever. The laws are seen as a life philosophy of the characters more akin to the Do, or the Wei in Japanese, like in Bushido, the Wei of the Samurai. I will compare and contrast the three main laws in the game using their views on friends, enemies, and the attitudes on conflict as a model. The three laws that are heavily explored are the law of balance, which you will read every time you boot up the game, basically, the law of might, and the law of justice. There are three, there are many other laws, and every character can be arguably accused of possessing one, especially the Musha characters, the warriors in possession of a Tsurugi. But these three are the most well-defined and are respectfully held by the MC, the villain, and other main character. The laws oppose one another, this creates conflict. Shout out to Jerry Freeman. So we start with the Law of Balance, followed by the protagonists Minato and Muramasa II. Minato being the tall, forever depressed guy on the right, and Muramasa the cutesy red spider tank beside him. Muramasa also enforces the law, which we learn about very soon in the story by the way of Tsurugi and Tsurugi smithing. You will read the word Tsurugi a lot in this game. Muramasa is a Tsurugi which can be described as armor with a soul. This law is the Tsurugi. The Tsurugi is made to proliferate the law. The law of balance is the first law we read about and can be summed up by the chant Minato says every time he duns Muramasa, i.e. before every battle. Where there are demons, I slay them. Where there are saints, I slay them. By itself it should be self-explanatory. The demons are evil, the saints are good. The second part of the chant is based on the quote said by the famous 9th century Chinese Buddhist monk, God forgive me if I butcher this dude's name, Lin Ji Yi Xuan, which goes, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. The main tenets of the law, as explained by its creator Muramasa I, are essentially a trade offer. One good for one evil, one friend for one enemy, one beloved for one despised. If you harbor any ill intentions towards someone and you want to kill them, in order to achieve that, you will have to kill someone you hold dear, or even yourself, because loving yourself or holding yourself dear also counts. For one life of your enemy, take one life of your friend, which is the reason why a lot of characters find this law utterly rad. In essence, for the law of balance, the concept of good and evil are non-existent, because every evil can hold good and good can hold evil. I explain it like this. Imagine a person who wants to rob someone of their money. In their attempt, they wound or kill someone. That person is evil in the eyes of the victim, but his starving family will be thankful for the money. The law of balance is introduced as a solution to all conflict because it follows because if people follow it, nobody will want to hurt anyone because there will always be a looming fear of having to murder someone you love for someone you despise. Next is the law of might, and is the law followed by the main antagonist Ginsego or Silver Star. As its namesake implies, this law means business, and by business it means that might definitely makes right. Pure might is seen as a luxury and also as a king's scepter of sorts with which one enforces this law, be it the law of might or any other. Might obeys the law of balance because the one who obeys the law of balance will eventually become the mightiest being under the heaven and earth. Might doesn't recognize good and evil, it doesn't recognize friend or foe, only might. Because of this, the law of might goes a step forward, then law of balance. Because no one is beloved and no one is despised, there is no price to pay. A creature exists only to be defeated and because of its complete denial of any human connection, the tenets of the law of balance don't need to be followed through. As long as one believes that he is the one deserving to rule the world, he doesn't have to pay the cost. The law of might is also seen as a solution to all conflict because in the end, only one creature, a god in a sense, 
will remain and he will regulate the laws of the world in its own way as well as establish absolute dominance over any other laws. Extremely rad. Finally, we have the Law of Justice, followed by the other main character, Ayane Ichijo on the right, and her cricket or grasshopper or whatever it is, Tsurugi Masamune, which is probably the simplest one to understand. Where there are demons, I slay them, where there is evil, I smite it. Basically what it says on the tin, evil will be stopped. There is a lot more nuance to it than this straightforward chant implies, but it is interesting how it has a clear distinction between demons and evil and proposes the slaughter of the former and the latter as well. Good fights evil, good protects friends from enemies, good is beloved and evil is despised. The tenets of the law of justice tells us that at all times the world can be seen as black and white. And seeing the world in that way is preferable if you wish to follow this law. One side is always right and the other side is always wrong. Good is justice because justice is the end to twisted and demonic things. With justice you can punish evildoers and stop others from committing evil acts. Justice has no price. This is explored in a very literal sense. This can be seen in the way both Ayane and Masamune fight, risking everything and anything to deliver justice as it is the good thing to do and at points it is stomach churning. The law of justice is also seen as a solution to all conflict because in the end one side, the good one, will prevail and one side will remain to uphold its tenets. Of course, this one is rad as well. The theme of crime and punishment is explored by the character of Otori Kanae. Kanae is a lieutenant in the occupying GHQ but is seen acting outside given orders and delivering vigilante punishment to perpetrators of heinous crimes. Her character also embodies the motif of possessing wisdom. The character is drawn with closed eyes and other characters sometimes think that she's sleeping while she's actually awake and vice versa. Kanae sees even with her eyes closed. She uses a sniper rifle and is an excellent sharpshooter. She is seen having incredible foresight into different plots and developments. It's in the eyes, man. The naming conventions of different things relating to her character imply possession of enhanced perception and insight into different things, and I'm not trying really hard not to spoil anything here, so I'll just move on. Besides that, her character is a walking contradiction. For example, she dresses in a western fashion but is actually from Japan. She looks calm and serene but is often downright hysterical. In order to uphold her ideas of crime and punishment, one must have a specific set of moral values and is able to realize that everyone is capable of committing crime at any given time. Kanae has this. Because of this, her work is tireless and even if she doesn't punish a crime, there will be punishment in the end. The next theme that's heavily explored is the idea of self-righteousness. We see this theme explored in the character of Muramasa I and his struggle to create a perfect Tsurugi. He cannot decide on what to believe in and the circumstances constantly push him in one direction or the other. After learning from an emperor's mentor called Uramu, he decides that in order to stop conflict in the world, you need to prevent people from owning a sense of self-righteousness. This forms the basis for the two Muramasas. Their Shingane, or the core in a very literal and figurative sense, on which the law of balance is based. For humans to have a sense of self-righteousness is seen as the root of all evil in the world, because humans are not capable of thinking and acting for the benefit of everyone else except themselves. You can also see this within the other laws as well, and every other character can be seen as being very stubborn because of it. They just won't budge, man. The fact they don't change could be credited to this sense of self-righteousness in humans. The idea of your way or the highway creates a lot of conflict and not a lot of room is left for leeway. But is it justified? Is having a sense of really that bad? It's worth exploring more. And from having a sense of self-righteousness, an idea that something is good and something is evil is born. For some characters it is one thing, for others it's something else. Throughout the story we meet a lot of characters who tell us that they think is the true good or true evil. What does the protagonist have to say about this? The game constantly reminds us that this is not a story of heroes, but we support and follow Minato and want to see him succeed in hunting down Ginsego. 
Minato is not an unwavering character, however, and at a couple of stages in the story he even changes sides completely, thinking that the other side might not be the clear-cut evil that he so believed. Not only that, Minato would even change a side because it is convenient at the moment. But even still, he has a very distinct moral compass and when he deems something as evil, the reader will agree even though he himself isn't a good guy. Besides this, his perspective is interesting because he was just an average civilian and one of the inner conflicts of his character are related to this idea of possessing normal values and normal goals if you want to call yourself a normal human being, even under completely wicked circumstances that he's in and failing to keep that idea of normalcy causes great pain to him. Other factions like the Shogunate or the GHQ have different views on this as well. The Shogunate doesn't view itself as evil, excusing their existence as a better alternative than total anarchy in Japan or occupation from Russia or GHQ. And the GHQ see the conquest of the mainland as an extension of the Queen's civility to other nations. But in their eyes, Japan is just another country that they need to take and move on. The Tsurugi are built on one of the beliefs of their creator and their continued existences depends on upholding this sense. For example, a Tsurugi cannot accept a Musha with a contrasting belief, and if a Tsurugi stops believing it, it will simply break apart. For this reason, the different Tsurugi we see are very withdrawn and do not allow others to invalidate their beliefs for they risk breaking apart. However, they still hold ideas of what is good and what is evil. On the completely opposite end, we have characters who argue that, knowing that he exists, God is one massive piece of shit. These characters do not justify the actions of others because, to them, it has been predetermined by a higher being. True evil created this world, so it is natural for us to be evil as well. If you want to do something about it, just go and find, kill, go and, find and kill God, my dude. There are many other minor themes explored through different characters, like one of the characters from the occupying GHQ whose real thoughts we only see in his letter to his beloved. There's also a pervasive idea of nationalism on both sides fighting for Japan as well. The feature of power is explored in the flashback arc, dealing with death, karma, Self-gratification is seen in the character of Yusa Doshin, God bless him. You can technically argue that he is not a bad person even though he calls himself one because he is a Basara. A Basara can never be good or bad. He is an artist. His art is enjoying himself. He only enjoys himself because it is what he does. The act of enjoying yourself cannot be judged. He is an interesting character. There is an entire chapter dedicated to racing mechas. Mentions of economic systems and an entire rant dedicated to the history of whaling, which is super amusing by the way. You can call Muramasa a lot of things, but you can't call it unambitious, which I think was also a purposeful decision coming from the director of this game. And with that said, I will finish this presentation. Thank you all for watching. Like and share the video to anyone you think would be interested to hear this. If I managed to convince you to give this little title a try, I'm glad. Peace out.